Hello and welcome back to my channel and to the second episode of Dinosaur Week. In this episode I'm going to be discussing The Land That Time Forgot, a 1975 dinosaur action adventure fantasy science fiction romp produced by Amicus Pictures, a British production company that was prolific in the 1960s and 70s, making low-budget horror, sci-fi and fantasy films. And several of their films featured Doug McClure, or Doug McClure, as Americans would prefer to call him. Um, Doug McClure was a big beefcake celebrity cowboy star in the 1950s and 60s. He did an awful lot of westerns and he was a very handsome leading young man. And then in the 1970s, um, all of a sudden, he became famous for making these uh, these bizarre, funny, low-budget monster movies. Um, he made three for Amicus and this was the first, The Land That Time Forgot. Um, the next one was At the Earth's Core and that was followed by the sequel to the land that time forgot, the people that time forgot in 1977. The story for the land that time forgot can be summed up very briefly, and in fact it is on the back of the DVD box. I shall read for you. A German U-boat torpedoes a British supply ship during World War I, and the survivors, Doug McClure and Susan Penhaligon, manage to sneak aboard. The U-boat gets lost and drifts into the mist-filled prehistoric land of Caprona, a long-forgotten and uncharted place near the South Pole. Soon they find themselves battling dinosaurs, Neanderthals and all manner of ferocious monsters whilst frantically trying to escape from the land that time forgot. And that is pretty much the entire story. So let's break it down, shall we? When the U-boat first arrives at Caprona, it's attacked almost immediately by a giant rubbery plesiosaur. I presume it's a plesiosaur. It attacks the crew, they fight it off, they eventually kill it, and it has a very rubbery death. And here we get one of the first pieces of hilarious intentional comedy uh, where the film cuts to the crew sitting around the dinner table feasting upon the plesiosaur that they've just killed. This is, as far as I can recall, the only time in a dinosaur movie that the heroes have eaten the dinosaur after killing it. And I found it very funny. I enjoyed that scene. After disembarking from the U-boat, the crew explore the local terrain and encounter a tribe of semi-friendly cavemen type creatures. Um, these actually have some surprisingly impressive prosthetics. They look quite good. They have tea pieces, which is essentially a protruding forehead and a nose piece. And I think they also have slightly built up cheekbones as well. And of course, 70s hairstyle styles and facial hair. Um, this is a 70s movie, even though it's set during the First World War, no one in it looks anything other than someone straight out of the 1970s, including the cavemen. It's just a shame that the budget couldn't stretch to any makeup below their chins. Shortly after befriending the local cavemen population, the landing party are set upon by a pair of allosaurs. These are very rubbery, they're not very good, they kind of... <laughs> Allosaurs. Thank you. I'll be here all day. They return to the U-boat and the friendly caveman, who is now apparently part of the crew, um, helps them with their fuel issue. You see, they've run out of oil and they need oil in order to be able to power up the sub and escape from the island. Luckily, the caveman apparently is an engineer. He understands instinctively what's wrong and he is able to communicate to them um, in the following manner. <coughs> From this, uh, the crew, mainly Susan Penhaligon, are able to deduce that he knows where they can find some crude oil. So the mission is clear. A joint expedition of German, British and American explorers must set off across Caprona, led by the friendly caveman, in search of crude oil, which they must then refine and use to refuel the sub so that they can get home safely. Further into the adventure, the explorers encounter some styracosaurs. Now, these dinosaurs 
offer no threat whatsoever. They don't eat meat, they're herbivorous, and they're minding their own business. They're not doing anybody any harm. However, the crew decide to use the U-boats on board cannons to blow the shit out of these styracosaurs. And it's very, very sad. One of them gets killed and cries. Once the explorers have fully sated their bloodlust, they make their way to a cavemen village, which is actually quite well done by the art department, and here they build an oil refinery. Yes, somehow they've got all the necessary tools, equipment and materials to build a fully functioning oil refinery, and at the native village they set it up and begin to refine their crude oil. While the oil is busy refining, um, various other events take place, there's some fighting, and the German U-boat captain does some science. At this point in the proceedings, I would like to take issue with the wasted opportunity of Susan Penhaligon's character. Now, at the beginning of the film, she's introduced as some sort of scientist, and she even gets to look through a microscope briefly. She also does a bit of translating when it comes to the friendly caveman. However, at some point in the movie, they seem to have decided that it's the German U-boat captain who really has all the scientific knowledge. He is, after all, some sort of amateur scientist. He has the necessary paraphernalia, including the microscope, that shows us the bacteria in the water. So Susan Penhaligon is relegated to bimbo. She's there to be eye candy and not much else. She also does a bit of screaming, gets chased, and gets herself into some difficulties from which Doug McClure has to rescue her. And it's a shame. It's very, very 70s. It's sexist. It's a wasted opportunity. What could have been a strong, empowered, interesting scientific expositional character is just along to be a bimbo. So anyway, the adventurers take themselves off in search of the source of evolution on this island, and they encounter the egg spawners. I'm calling them egg spawners because I think that's what they are. Um, they're essentially a group of nubile young females cavorting in the all together, splashing about in a pool of water, some sort of giant cauldron. And it's vaguely explained to us that what they're doing is spawning. They're laying eggs. <laughs> yes, that's right, they're laying eggs. And um, these eggs float um, out of the cauldron into the river, and as they progress downriver, evolution happens to them somehow. So, shortly after discovering about egg spawning women and evolution, um, and frankly not a moment too soon, there is another dinosaur attack, and this time it's pterodactyls, and they are hilariously bad. They're awful. The one good thing that can be said about these pterodactyls is that they're full-scale life-size models. They have a wingspan of 32 feet, and essentially they dangle from a very large crane. Um, their wings are fixed and rigid, so they fly round and round in circles without any flapping at all. They do have articulated mouths that can open and close, and one of them uses his open and closing mouth to snatch up our friendly caveman and fly away with him. And it's very, very sad. Doug McClure does some acting. More events transpire, including one of my favourite classic movie cliches of the era, quicksand. And of course, it's Susan Penhaligon, our friendly neighbourhood bimbo, who falls into the quicksand and has to be rescued by Doug McClure. I don't understand why quicksand was such a big deal in the 1970s, but it really, really was. I remember as a young boy at school, when I used to be drawing treasure maps during class instead of paying attention to the lesson, my treasure maps always included a large patch of quicksand, Quicksand was a thing. It happened a lot and everyone always fell in it. So, Doug McClure rescues Susan Penhaligon from the quicksand and a volcano erupts. As the volcano erupts, the crew of the U-boat make their cowardly escape, marooning Doug McClure and Susan Penhaligon in the process. And that's kind of it. 
The end. Doug and Susan are marooned on Dinosaur Island. Most of the dinosaurs burn to death horribly, the submarine has sunk, and there's nothing they can do except head off in search of presumably somewhere to make a home and a convenient cliff top from which to throw a message in a bottle. The message that we saw at the very opening of the film. So that's it. End of story. It's a terrible film. Really, really bad. God-awful, atrocious, hilariously appalling. In fact, so bad it's good. And that's why films like this should be cherished. They don't make movies like this anymore. Now, no one sets out to make a bad movie. The people that made this film really genuinely believed in what they were doing and wanted to make a good film. And they did their best, and it shows. There is an awful lot of love on the screen. They tried really hard. They just didn't have the money and they didn't have the necessary skills skills to pull it off. And of course the technology hadn't yet been invented that could make films like this realistic and properly engaging. CGI was a long, long way from being invented, so they did the best that they could with what they had. Rubber models. And for that reason it's a cherishable film, cherishably bad. I love every minute of it and I've got an enormous amount of nostalgia for this film and also all the others in the series and in the genre. And I think that pretty much sums it up. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, you know what to do. Hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, leave a comment or two and I will see you next time. See you later.